they thought it was about old people coming to Florida to die. They found out soon enough it wasn't. It's about something that happens to everyone many times in life, but it happens especially quickly and uh, irreversibly to any immigrant. When you go to a different country, you die and you instantly have to become another person. <coughs> Whether you want to or not, you become another person. You have to. In the case of an exile as opposed to an immigrant, there's an added twist, and that the exile cannot return home. Doesn't know when he or she is returning home. So the death is deeper, and the changes that take place are deeper. In the case of the Pedro Pan children, all 14,000 of us, and we don't know how many other thousands who are not counted because they're not part of the official airlift, but left without their parents. Even the not only lost your country, your culture, but you've lost your parents and your family. And it's, it's an instantaneous death. Ask any Pedro Pan. Getting on that plane and getting off. Two different people. Immediately. Subtle things, such as the name that, you know, suddenly you become Charles or Mary, some American version of the name, like my Chinese neighbor next door in Connecticut, calls himself Joseph. I know Joseph is not his name. <laughs> and then he had a kid, and he said, you know, he introduced this kid as Anthony, but he says, you know, but that's not his real name. His real name is, I can't remember what the Chinese name is. Not just exile, any immigrant comes have to learn about. This book works on several levels, and this is what I want to talk to you about. As a historian, this book is history. As a scholar of religion uh, and a person of faith, this book also has a religious dimension, which my publisher doesn't like for me to talk about. <laughs> no quicker way to turn off an audience. Uh, consider it philosophical if you don't like religion. <laughs> the theme of dying and being reborn. Everyone, even if they stay in the town where they were born, has to learn to die more than once in life. All of us in this room who are adults or young adults are exiles from childhood. Childhood is a country to which you can never return. If you return to your parents' house and to your room, mm -hmm. it's too bad. It's not your original country. Time is the dimension of exile. Younger audiences never laugh when I say this. Anyone who's gotten married has died. You <laughs> <laughs> enter that church one person and leave <laughs> Man in my audience once said, yeah, sometimes three times. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the, uh, the reverse side of learning to die is, is learning how to be reborn. And uh, how to do that with grace. How to learn how to let go. This is all about. And the Pedro Pan kids, uh, myself included, we had a lot of letting go to do. Some of it was very difficult. Some not at all, because as they say, children are flexible, children adjust. Yeah, children adjust uh, until they turn 30. <laughs> and then you have to start dealing with all the stuff that you didn't deal with at the time. We must all come to terms with our deaths and our rebirths. And we have to continually reinterpret who we are and how we get to where we're going. And that's what this book is about on a sort of deeper philosophical level. On the historical level, which, you know, of course I would never say is a superficial level, no. As a testimony, a first person account from history, this is the history of Pedro Panier. And in here I detail, for instance, you know, and, and my story is different from everyone else's story, but there's a similarity to it. There's departing. There's the 
being here without your parents, and then there's the reunion. For some of us, in between, there's a lot of problems. In my case, it's because you have the record book. I spent two, year, two weeks at uh, Florida City at a camp. The minute I arrived, my brother went to one camp, and I went to another camp. <coughs> Kendall, which was then the edge of the universe, <laughs> uh, where there was a camp for teen boys, and I went to Florida City, where they sent the pre-teen boys and all the girls. And this is uh, 1962. You don't want to put teenage boys and teenage girls together. You just don't do that. Then uh, my brother was picked up by one family, foster family, here in Miami, and I was picked up by a different foster family. They were friends with each other, so that worked out very nice. We saw each other regularly. And the way kids are, they actually force us to call each other. His family was Jewish, too, and uh, we both thought we had it made. We would never have to go to church again. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our foster parents forced us to go to church mm -hmm. on Sunday and gave us money to put into the collection, which we were sorely tempted to keep. <laughs> <laughs> then came the missile crisis, and uh, these families hadn't taken us, taken us in permanently. They had children of their own. In my case, my family had just adopted uh, two little kids, one less than two years old, the other one only eight months old. And I've gone back to this house in West Jim. It was tiny. They didn't take us in permanently. Oh. They let us go. And then my brother and I were reunited in a group home. Lovely house. It's for sale, by the way. I passed by it yesterday. <laughs> 426. Northwest, 20th Avenue, a hellhole, if there ever was one, <laughs> run by a Cuban couple, where half of us were Pedro Pan kids, the other half were Cuban kids from families that had fallen apart and they had already been in trouble with the law. So you could call it a home for juvenile delinquents. I call it El Palacio de la Cucaracha. Cockroaches everywhere. And mice and scorpions. And then they forgot about us. They, whoever was running the program, forgot about us. And one day, about nine months later, a uh, social worker comes in and sees my brother and says, wow, What are you kids doing? You're supposed to be with your uncle. Your uncle would have moved to the Midwest. And within less than a month, we were with our uncle in Bloomington, Illinois. And our mom came three and a half years later, and um, our dad never got out. He was trying to get out in 1976 when he had a heart attack and died. And many of us, Pedro Pan, who had this experience. And I've actually had more than one fellow Pedro Pan tell me, you know, you're lucky you never got to see your father again. You're very lucky because you didn't have to watch your father fall apart which happened to many fathers who came here and suddenly at age 50-something or 60-something had to start over. The uncle I went to live with is a perfect example of adjustment that I don't think I can make. He left Cuba at age 62. He had been an architect in Cuba with his own car. Had just finished building his dream home. He had to leave it all behind. Plus, he had a daughter with Down syndrome. Came to the U.S. and started over again at and ended up working as a draftsman for like ninety dollars a week in Bloomington, Illinois, and never complained. But every week would write letters to the newspaper correcting their news 